What to make of this much-used, little-understood phrase, confidence and supply? Where does it come from and how does it actually work? Well, here's our explanation. <laughs> Governments are simple creatures. If they're going to be stable and productive, they need a couple of basic essentials, a supply of money and the confidence of parliament. A government with a commons majority doesn't need to worry much about either of those things. It can vote itself whatever cash it needs to function and can't collapse as long as its own MPs support it when it comes to the crunch. But what if a single party doesn't have a majority? Well, as we saw after the last election, it can club together with another party which signs up, in theory at least, to support an agreed government programme. This is a formal coalition and is surprisingly common in recent history. But there's another way for a government to function on a more basic level, where another party agrees to help the government raise the money it needs to operate and to support it if the opposition try to bring it down but they might want some kind of sweetener in return. This is called a confidence and supply agreement, and if the electoral arithmetic works out as predicted, this obscure constitutional arrangement may be on everyone's lips over the next year. The principle of supply stems from the earliest days of Parliament in the medieval period, where the king discovered that, despite his divinely ordained power, he was not always able to rustle up the necessary cash to fund his wars or his private peccadilloes. To do that, he was obliged to use the most powerful people in each area, the commoners, to raise money at a local level. In time, the commoners, sitting in the House of Commons, realised that they had huge power to alter the king's policies by cutting off his cash flow. This is called loss of supply. As parliamentary democracy developed, the ability to secure supply through a budget became a key indicator of whether a government was viable and sometimes became the heart of a constitutional crisis like when the Lords were stripped of their veto powers for voting down the People's Budget of 1909. Which brings us to the confidence bit. Motions of no confidence in the government might be triggered by losing a supply vote, but they can also be tabled by governments themselves to bring rebels back into line, or by opposition sensing blood. To be secure, a party in government needs to know that it has the votes to stave off any threat to bring it down. There is no real pedigree for confidence and supply agreements in recent British politics. The closest was the Lib Lab Pact in 1977, but even that lasted just 18 months. However, with a formal coalition looking unattractive to both Labour and the Conservatives, that might be about to change come May. This strange little creature may be about to have its moment in the sun. <laughs>